I'm going to talk about uh, challenges or engineering challenges in building operational AI. Um, and before that, um, sort of my, my story of AI is filled with failures. Uh, when I st my first failure with AI was when I um, back at university in 1997, I think it was. I took a course in neural networks, and we ambitiously tried to build an Othello game that would use um, uh, a neural network to evaluate board positions that, that failed miserably. And I will get back to some of the failures uh, according, you know, during this presentation. So, um, uh, but anyway, I'm uh, Daniel Skanse and I'm head of engineering at Pelterian and we are an AI platform company. We build uh, um, yeah, a product to make um, AI more visual, like a visual workflow for, for uh, building uh, deep learning, essentially. Um, uh, yeah, let's uh, move on. Yeah, so AI will uh, impact every facet of life, just like the industrial revolutions did. Uh, at this conference, and usually this makes some buzz in the audience when I talk about it, but at this conference, I'm not so sure it will. But anyway, if you consider if you consider the impact that things like self-driving cars uh, and radiology, uh, new ways of performing diagnosis, um, which we actually did work with, we'll see some more of that in the presentation, the impact on health technology and everything, uh, that's just, just a few examples. We are currently seeing uh, society being changed as we speak. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about developer. I'm not an uh, AI expert. I may, should have, maybe I should have mentioned that in the intro. That first failure. After that, I didn't work with AI for for many, many like 15 or years or whatever, 20 years, I guess. And then I was back uh, doing AI at Pelterian and found myself as being the head of engineering. So, I have a long <coughs> background from engineering, but not so much background from AI. But I, you know. We got into this the last years. So anyway, this is sort of the, from the more developer perspective side. When you get into AI, when you try to do something with it, when you try to put it in production, uh, you know that type of framing of this um, um, presentation. So one thing we first. So if you look at the, we're going to look at a few problems here. So if you look at this. Very, very simple problem in a way. Th this is apparently some guy that is very, he built even a website uh, about it. He's super upset about CSV files. They're the root of all evil. Uh, everybody that tried to work with the CSV uh, and put it into production, you know, you'll find that all hell breaks loose. For example, in this case, if you, um, w w we face that, if you let the customers upload CSV files and then um, it's really hard to um, specify them properly. Uh, in this case, uh, you expect a certain column to be of a certain data type. Uh, you get customers to upload their data. You'll very soon find that the data is full of errors. And how do you accurately detect and sniff out what data type it's supposed to be in each column without uh, you know, like a proper schema to, to describe this? It's quite, quite annoying, quite hard. It's not impossible, though. So if you move on to this type of problem, which I'm all I'm sure you've all seen uh, similar uh, types in your everyday work. Anyway, to classify um, and even find and draw bounding boxes around objects and image, images, that's without any sort of special machine learning or AI tech, it's really quite hard to, to imagine how you even would approach it. Maybe some, you know, like feature detectors, convolution, something, but it's quite hard. And if you move on to this problem about you know, indicating each pixels of the, the, these uh, brain scans that um, um, contains a tumor, that type of problem is, from an engineering perspective, even more baffling. It's really hard to know even how to approach that. And this, I, I think there was some speech about wind power uh, before at this conference. I wasn't at it. But anyway, do these types of things, it's, uh, again, absolutely not trivial to solve with conventional techniques. So I guess, I guess you, know, you, you know where I'm heading. What do these problems have in common? Well, they're hard or unsolvable in a sense with conventional techniques, 
And I'm sure you kind of guessed it, that deep learning actually can solve these problems. And we have solved uh, all of these problems using uh, deep learning at Peltarian. Sorry for looking up all the time, by the way. I don't have, my, I don't have the presentation here, and I kind of have to do that, so bear with me. Uh, yeah, so wh why is this tech so, so powerful? Of course, there, there are many answers to this uh, question, but for me, again, there are some specific properties that has been uh, extra of extra interest. Uh, first off, it's the flexibility part. I mean, if you look at um, conventional, yeah, we're going we're to get back to that actually. But the the, the first that, that comes to mind here in, in in this context is that the ability to work with multiple data types in the same model. You know, you basically can take. You know, you have. Uh, images, you have uh, tabular data maybe, you have, may have um, audio data, and you can put everything in the same model and work with it because deep learning can learn how to represent data, not only like uh, see, see patterns in it. And then another very interesting uh, um, characteristic is that you can reuse part of models, uh, transfer learning essentially, and I think those types of characteristics makes deep learning uh, superior to so many other techniques. And if you, um, if you compare a sort of more old school solution with deep learning, for me as a developer, what seems the most easiest way to, to get into is it, is it to do all these very advanced pre-processing steps or just to put whatever image you have in this imagined retinal diagnosis system and just throw it on the, on the, on the model. Obvious, quite obviously, the, the reality is slightly more complicated than this, but it, at least it's, uh, I think it's kind of, on a general level, is quite, quite close. Uh, yeah, and the other really attractive part of deep, uh, of, um, of, uh, deep learning is, uh, or sort of the, the thing that warrants its uh, operational uh, existence. Because, but again, I should mention that too, I think this operational aspect of it, is this uh, technology ready to be put in production? Because, I mean, sure, it's very interesting to use some exciting technology in the lab, but does it really have what it takes to be put in production? And I would claim, yes, it has, even though you m it may take weeks uh, and um, a lot of machines in order to, uh, to train the models. Uh, I think the BERT uh, model took, uh, yeah, rumored to be several weeks with hundreds of machines, super expensive. So that is clearly not an option for everybody. But once these models are trained, the lookup time is really fast, typically below a few hundred milliseconds. So they, uh, this technology is kind of suited for operational use. Uh, this is supposed to play some funny videos to make you all laugh. Uh, it's usually very interesting. I can watch these droids, these poor robots, for hours to just feel, see them fall over and fail. And I think uh, this is a bit what... Um, what um, I mean, failure is a huge... Comp like I said in the beginning, failure is a, a sort of huge component of... of um, um, AI, I would say all AI, but at, um, at least data-driven AI, but also uh, deep learning specifically. And you hear a lot about the success story in the media, but you do not hear so much about the failures, but there, there, trust me, there, there's a lot of them. Uh, and w why, why do we have these failures? I think one, one very uh, important component here is that it's a completely different workflow, it's a completely different mindset that you have to kind of embrace. Um, from a software engineering perspective, working with um, reasoning about a problem, then you can usually, you can, you can, in those cases, you can like imagine a problem, you can reason about it, you can also reason about the path, how you get there. But when you work with uh, d deep learning specifically, you have to, um, um, uh, you have to explore a lot of different options. That is, it's not as intuitive. Uh, it's not as easy to know if a, if, if, uh, if a solution would work or not uh, until you try it. It's because the problem statement has moved to the data, so the data needs to describe the problem well enough. Uh, so th this makes it really hard to manage expectations also. It affects the entire organization, how you work together, the expectations, the, the money you invest in a project and everything. Uh, so that is, I would say, one part of why, why projects fail, because you're not prepared to... Um, 
you know, deal with the fact that they do fail, and then you may pull the entire plug on the entire initiative. Uh, another um, consequence of that is that um, you need, you know, deep learning needs a lot of a lot of data essentially, because the pro again the problem statement has moved to the data. The data needs to describe the problem well enough in order for you to to um, uh, yeah to, to to solve the problem essentially. So uh, it's usually a very troublesome to find find the right data, and especially for for um, big problems, really complicated ones, you would need. Uh, models with many parameters, you would need vast amounts of data in order to um, uh, to build proper models. And it's also quite hard sometimes, even though it intuitively it may be very easy to, to uh, understand and you know reason about a certain problem, you also need to be able to describe them mathematically, to provide metrics for how you measure your problems, and that may also be a bit uh, troublesome. And I think this is uh, quite an important one. These different way of working has caused different um, cultures to emerge. So we have, and that can be a, a big problem when you, again, when you reason about projects, when, when, you, when you discuss choices about technology and, 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 and how you build things, engineering aspects of, of, of AI. So it's really uh, good to have in mind to see where these groups that usually work together with these, these pro, uh, um, kinds of projects, where they come from and what they believe is important. Um, yeah, there were two more. So anyway, yeah, l like, l like you see here, I mean, software engineering is usually about, again, reasoning about a path to a certain, solving a certain uh, problem. It's about reliability, making sure something works all the time. Whereas the sort of, from the machine learning point of view, which is much stronger connected to research, there is a sort of slight tilt towards uh, experimentation, proof of concept work, and new technology. So those two has to play together in order to, to, for this to be working when you put it into production. And then the existing tooling is, is sort of more also tilted towards res the research. We've seen some great initiatives here, the speech before. I think that could be a wonderful tool to, to use when you productionize these things. So certainly there, there are things happening here, but currently today a lot of the work is done in, in, in notebooks and sort of a, a lot of different tools that maybe that sometimes are very hard to put into to production. And then you have the glue code and dependency uh, problem. Uh, you, you typically, you know, patch a lot of different uh, tools together, uh, and that can cause a nightmare when you try to maintain these systems because one version may update and that may not be compatible with other versions and so forth. The, the background image is um, the dependency graph of those libraries uh, installed, and usually you would have uh, many more libraries. So, yeah can be um, problematic. Um, yeah, now to my next failure. Um, um, so it's the proof of concept trap. Just because it works in the lab, it doesn't mean it works in the real world. And I experienced this when I was new to Peltarian, and I was working with this. Uh, I'm sure everybody are familiar with the MNIST uh, uh, data set. So we worked, uh, we were new to it. and kind of the Hello World project where you uh, build a handwritten digit classifier. So me and a colleague, we started to work on that, and we had some coffee with the sales team, and we felt like, hey, it could be a cool uh, gadget to uh, impress the customers with. If, if I write, um, if I code um, um, uh, an, an iPhone app that you could use to just snap a photo of um, um, a digit you write on the whiteboard and have it classified properly, that could be uh, yeah, that could be kind of impressive to the customers. It should be a simple afternoon hack. So, uh, so we did, and we gathered the salespeople in, in the room, and uh, we were going to show them our fantastic uh, solution. Uh, well, first off, it really, yeah, well, maybe it's, it's a bit rounded there, so maybe we thought, we thought but no, uh, the salespeople, they weren't really <laughs> impressed. Uh, and good thing we didn't show them that one. <laughs> Uh, so, either we could tell the salespeople that we built an 8 classifier, so as long as they only write 8s, they, they would be all fine, or we could solve the real problem. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you understand what it is. If you look at those two images, uh, 
from our perspective, they look quite you know, similar. It's pretty clear a two and a three. But if you look at these images from the MNIST data set, they're actually, you know, they're black and white. Uh, they, they have not any, they're not augmented in any way, essentially. So we didn't augment the data set when we trained. So uh, quite obviously, it was really hard for the model to, to uh, uh, work properly. Uh, we corrected it, and then it worked. Um, but it's also interesting. We had to we had to put take whatever solution we had and put it into the field for us to understand this because the data was so different. And I think that is a very important part of of real sort of operational AI work. Also, to really quickly be able to to you know work and test it out. Yeah. Also, we had some. We, maybe we should have asked around because I think this problem and a few others could have been, uh, we, you know, we could have been notified of it because we actually wrote a paper on the this topic and many others, uh, uh, some, some people at the company. Uh, so, anyway, something more about the, um, uh, the proof of concept, um, no, the notion of pr proof of concept. It's usually quite easy to, I mean, usually you do some sort of uh, pipeline like this. You, have, you do some one-off work, you pre-process, uh, you, you whip up some pre-processing, you model it, you post-process it, and you do some analysis, and then you iterate. Uh, and then you hopefully come up with a really good solution. Uh, the problem with that is, I mean, that's all fine, but when you want to put it in production, those two inverted boxes that are model and analysis tools, that's actually the, the, the previous slide. There are so many other systems around it that you would need to, to, to maintain and have up for, for this to work. And that, again, from an organization point of view and a company point of view, putting AI in production becomes much, much more, much, bigger of a challenge. Yeah, so um, design, I, I struggled a bit to find, find the proper word here. Design, it's not have, it doesn't have anything to do with visual design. I'm sure you understand that. It's more of how you, the approach while designing uh, AI systems that I'd like to uh, share with you. So first off, again, back to the failure thing, you have to be prepared to, uh, to fail. Um, um, I think that quote sums it up fairly, fairly well. Um, and then, but you know, fa just failing doesn't mean that everybody has to repeat the same mistakes. So, I hope to be able to share some with what we've seen previously on the following slides. I hope to be able to share at least some, some, um, uh, some of the learnings uh, we've made. So. Uh, Summarized here is there is something I can point with yeah yeah apparently there is yeah well anyway <laughs> uh, yeah p first off put exp the, the thing I said about the, the the workflows again put experimentation at core that has to saturate the entire work group you have to put it uh, at core and you have to be prepared that it is very hard to reason about projects uh, so embrace the data driven workflow and make sure your processes and the whatever tooling and platform and whatever you use supports that uh, to 100 percent. And then uh, you should also be able to uh, cater for collaboration uh, in inside the entire team because sometimes AI gets like put into the basement of some really uh, smart people working with it, and then out comes very interesting. Um, uh, stuff, but it's very hard to understand and reason about it. So the more people you can get close to the data and close to what's happening, the better it is, uh, because that helps the entire project uh, in so many ways. And then uh, data privacy and GDPR. Uh, before, it was easy. You didn't have to care so much. Right now, we've all seen that it's becoming more and more. I mean, I think it's fair also. Data is we're moving so much of the problem statement to the data, and we're handling more and more information. Obviously, this has to be thought of from the beginning when you design these systems. Um, it's very hard to add a proper filtering of data, proper uh, right implement, implement right, the right to be forgotten and those things. It's super hard to implement that afterwards. So that is, of course, very important. Um, and then, uh, again, back to the POC trap. Make sure that whatever you build can integrate easy, easily in the solutions uh, you have, so you can test it in the field as quickly as possible. Uh, 
version everything, that probably goes without saying, but given the current state of tooling, like you saw before, it's a lot of different tools tied together that requires a lot of structure uh, for you because it doesn't really direct you, and those tools don't really direct you in any way. Uh, so you have to come up with your, your practices on how to ver version stuff. Um, at least if you uh, target the sort of, if you're at the code level. Uh, and then, yeah, oh, you know, we tried with some own hardware for some time, but it's uh, so much easier and you s save so much time by, by uh, using the cloud providers. So that's kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, also very important. Yeah, so I want to, I don't know how, how, what, what, the, what the time is, but I want to end this speech with just um, mentioning that um, think in terms of a framework or a platform really early on, because it's so many moving parts like you saw before. So think of some early on, start to think of how you want to approach these uh, projects. So you don't like run away and do one thing at one project, and then you have to reinv reinvent the wheel for the, for the next one. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I was supposed to say. I don't know if I have time. I have some some um, uh, interesting uh, or well, well interesting some vision about uh, AI and agriculture, which I think is kind of important, um, interesting. But I don't know if you, if yeah yeah I'll run it through really quickly because I think it's really it's more like a sort of an approach. Somebody should do this, something about this. I think it's an interesting idea. So it would be to uh, use AI in agriculture. Uh, so uh, agriculture is the livelihood of 40% of the world's, um, uh, yeah, the world's population and produces 80% of our food. Uh, but the small farms, there is only a, a sort of fraction of their potential. Uh, and uh, deep learning uh, models that pres um, sort of provide insight and makes predictions on how they should fertilize their soil, how they should uh, plan their their. Um, what they should grow and everything uh, that could um, that could really really help help things. So yeah, that was the last one. I just encourage you all smart people to do something about that. I think that could be a game changer. Thank you.